Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. We are going through Bhagavad Gita. We are on chapter 11. We're going to start with verses 17 through 20. We'll have either one or two readings um, in English, and then Yogeshwar is going to recite them in Sanskrit and talk about them. And we'll open it up for any comments or questions. Yogeshwar, go ahead. Kiritinam gadinam chakrinam cha tejo rashim sarvato dittimantam pashyamitvam dur nirikshyam samantat diptanal arkad yutima prameyam. What Arjuna now is describing is his best view. Uh, how he can view Krishna. Now, Krishna has all this before as well. We know that uh, a king at that time would wear a crown, even, even in, in the war, yeah? they would be wearing the crown. It will be a, a small crown, not the huge that they would wear on, on the seat, but they would always be wearing a crown to show that they are the king. So in a way, Krishna was a king and he was wearing a crown from before. Yeah, Like when they started Gita, he was wearing a crown. But Arjuna pointing it out at this time is something different. It's not the usual that he is seeing. It's not the usual that he's experiencing. Yeah? It's like, um, walking past the flowers every day when you're going to walk. But then one day when you're not going to walk, you're just free and you have some free time. And then you go into the garden just to view the flowers. And then when you say that, yes, I can see the flowers, that's totally different from just gazing your view or gazing your eyes just through the flowers. Totally different. The experience is different. And the state of mind is different as well. Because there you've gone for the flowers and you're seeing the flowers. You're not just thinking about them using your past views, like, did I, did I think flowers were great? Or did I think that thorns were there and they would prick me, nothing. Just go there for the flowers. You're just there, look at them, view them. And that's another experience. Rather than just saying, I know the sun rises every day, but now looking at the sun and just how it rises. And then maybe when it's setting, like how it's setting by the, seaside or by the beach and that's another experience you'll have no words you'll say yes the sun is setting but there is something different there it's not the same as every day so arjuna pointing these things out that yes i can see you you have a crown you have a discus and you have uh, you have a mess so i can see these weapons that you that you carry it's like he has been seeing them every day but this is totally different now you're looking at krishna like as if you're looking at krishna for the first time now that's how arjuna is viewing krishna so he's going into as much detail as he can like we would say that the sun is setting so the sky is a, a bit orange and i can just see half the sun you know, it's always there. And logically, like there's nothing new in that. But experientially, everything is new in that. There's nothing old in that. Tejo Rashim Sarvato Dipti Mantam. Now, these are all Krish talking about Krishna. That how does Krishna look at this time? Tejo Rashim. He is 
filled with so much light. So much light. It's like, you know, you look at somebody's face and you just see that it's lightened up. In words, you'll say it's lightened up, but there is that difference that you see in it. And in Krishna, the whole body of Krishna would show that. It will show all light. It will show all that energy within, all that life within. It's in every hair of Krishna. So that's Arjuna is realizing this at this moment that I've been with Krishna all this time, but this energy he has, this subtle energy, Sarvato Dipti Mandam, not only he himself is lightened up, but Sarvato Dipti Mandam as well. Like he is lighting up everything else that he is coming in contact with. Like if he comes in contact with another person, he is also lighting that other person up. Uh, Yogeshwar, I need to step away for a minute. Uh, Joe, could you handle moderating if okay. you could? Thank you. Absolutely. Sorry about the interruption. Go ahead, Joe. Yes. So you can see what Arjuna is trying to refer to here is two things. Yes, he is lightened up. But now he's also lightening up everything else that he comes in contact with. Each and every person he comes in contact with is lightened up in a different way. Like you won't see rays coming out of him, like literal light rays, but there's that radiance within him. And the only way you can say is he's lit up, but he's not really lit up. It's metaphorically he is lit up because he has this, all this energy within him. And he has all this knowledge within him. He's doing all the right karma that he's supposed to do. He has all this love, unconditional, that has no conditions, whether there's somebody in front of him or it's just nature in front of him. He's just as loving. You know, there are some people that when you go towards, it's like, you just get another feeling when you get near them. That feeling is what Arjuna is having here. Totally different. You are like, I'm seeing you. Yes, like I'm seeing you. But I also see that aspect of you, that Dur Niriksha. Like nobody can really see you in a way. I have been seeing you since. Like from the start of Gita and even before that, we were friends, we were relatives, we had all these types of relations between us. We used to crack jokes between us, we used to eat together. I used to see you, but I am seeing you now in a different way. And I am also seeing that aspect that is Dur Niriksham, meaning that. It is not easy to see. It has taken me 10 chapters of Gita to start seeing you like this. So you are like Dur Niriksha. Nobody can really look at you and know you. As have known you after, after these chapters of Gita. Dipta Nalarka Dyuti Ma Prameyam. How can I say how light, delightful you are, how lightened up you are? The only thing I can say is Dipta Analarka. It's like the sun has just risen and I'm looking at the sun directly in front of me. The sun is so near me. Even my eyes right now, it's like I can't open my eyes towards you. That's how lightened up you are. That's why here he says, Dutim, so such light is of you. And as well, Aprameyam. Aprameyam meaning that you cannot be known in a way. 
And even right now, as Arjuna is looking at Krishna and is experiencing all this, he is still knowing that I have known Krishna all this much, but there is this part of him that I still do not know. There is this infinity in him. It's like Krishna is infinite. You know infinity in a way, but when you go to describe infinity, you can't actually say how many numbers it has. In a way, it is by its own quality. It's unknowable. So that's how Krishna is. Like That's how the ultimate is. You will know the ultimate. That's like you will have experience of the ultimate. But by its own nature, the ultimate is even though you know it, yes, in, it's infinite, but still, as in, you can't count how many numbers there are in. So it's, it's unknowable in a way. In that way, it's unknowable. But experientially, you will have some experience. Another thing about Aparamayam is also that now when you talk about the infinite to somebody else, it's really hard to describe. It's like you'll say one, two, three, four, hundred thousand, ten thousand, everything comes in the infinite. And the other person will say, Yes, I know one, two, three, four, hundred thousand, ten thousand, I know all that. So do I know the infinite? And then you'll say, No, no, not yet, not yet. As in the infinite is so much more, but all this thing comes in. So that's how we are also trying to describe the ultimate. It's like the peripheral comes within the ultimate, yes. But only knowing the peripheral is like knowing one, two, three, four, hundred, thousand, ten thousand in the infinite. It's in the same proportion of knowing the material world. So infinite, you can't even know where it goes up to. That's how ultimate is. You can't know where it goes up to. The material, it's the peripheral, is part of it. It's not that it's not part of it. But when you only look at the numbers that we know, you're not capturing infinity in a way. So even in that way, Krishna is a pramayam. He can't be known. Tvamaksharam paramam veditavyam, Tvamatsya vishvasya param nidhanam, Tvamavyaya shaswata dharma ghopta, Sanatanastvam purusho matome. So you are unknowable. Like I can't get to know you fully. Another thing. Arjuna is saying, I am knowing about you at this moment, is you are aksharam, meaning you're imperishable. You do not have a birth, you do not have a death. And also in between those, you don't have any type of decay. Like there's nothing about you that fades away, even a little bit. As Krishna was himself. His life, his energy was like that. It was imperishable. Even if you see him as a human being, like his energy was totally imperishable. Whatever obstacles came, he was just head on. He was just going through them. Whatever life brings to him. Now, Arjuna is also talking about the other way he's viewing Krishna as the ultimate, like as infinite, as that underlying, unmanifest, that the manifest holds on to. So in that way as well, he is Aksharam. He, there's nothing of the ultimate that fades away. And now Arjuna is telling Krishna, I know you as the ultimate. I know you as the unmanifest. Even though I'm seeing your body, 
as it is, I'm seeing your form, but I can also see the function within. I can see that unmanifest that you're talking about within you. Paramam Veditavyam. Now, you see, just like one sentence above, Arjuna is pointing out that Krishna is a Pramayam. He can't be known. And just in the next sentence, in the next verse, Arjuna is saying that Paramam Veditavya, like that is what everyone should be knowing. It's something that should be known by everyone, even by me or anyone else. He is that ultimate. He, in that way, he is so transparent, if we could view Krishna, that when you see him, even as the human form, you can see the ultimate within. You can see that light within. You can see that radiance from within that shows you, that points towards the ultimate. And that is Paramam Veditavya. It is what should be known. It is that, that if you do not know that, then you do not know anything. Arjuna is saying, yes, I know you're unknowable. Still, I'm saying that you should be known. So this type of language that Arjuna is now using, like before Arjuna would be like, that logical type in, if you see at the, like the chapters two, chapter one, you would be of that logical type that if you can't be known, why should I try to know you? That should be the logic. If something can never be known, like not that we don't have the instruments now, but it can never be known. Then why even try to know it? Because it can never be known. But now Krishna, uh, Arjuna has, also come to this illogical type of language right this experiential sorry sorry oh i'm sorry i i, I no i didn't mean okay sorry yeah that's fine yeah so that experiential type of language that i know you can never be known fully you're like the infinite but still that is what is supposed to be known. There's nothing else that is worth knowing. Tvamasya vishvasya param nidhanam. You are like the completion, you're like the fruit of the whole world. It's like when we see a seed, we do not keep the seed for the seed. Yeah? We do not sow the seed into the ground, into the soil, for the seed itself. What we sow the seed for is that fruit that we shall get. And you won't get it directly. You'll get its first, you'll have the seed, then it will become a seedling, it will go to a full-fledged plant, then leaves will come out and branches and then flowers and then you'll have this fruit at the end and that's like you know that's like the completion of the fruit it's like that end don't look at the end as in end end but end meaning that it has come to its fulfilled state it's come to its like full-fledged flat state there's nothing to go more than this. It is the sweetest fruit that you could get. So in that sense, Krishna is the end of this world. Like he can see, Arjuna can see that Krishna is like Purnata, is like that full-fledged human being, like what a human being can be at the most fulfilled state experientially even according to knowledge or action anything 
he is the full-fledged person. So in that way as well, Krishna is the end of the whole world. He's like that fruit that you get at the end of the whole seed. Tvamavyaya Shaswata Dharma Gopta Avyaya Meaning that, yes, I know you do not perish. But I also know that each and every second, yeah, even though we would say that somebody dies at the age of maybe 100, 120, or 80, whatever you take it. But we also notice that there is cell degeneration continuously happening. Like there is cell generation that is happening. And then there's also degeneration that is continuously happening. It's like, yes, you're not dying at that time. Your death is like at 100 years or 80 years. But there's that aspect of you that is dying. You are perishing, you're fading away in small bits even. So in that way, Arjuna is saying that, I know you, Krishna. Even at that subtle level, I've already said that you are akshara, meaning you do not perish. But even at the subtle level of um, maybe you're not perishing, like you're not dying at the end, but even in the middle, there's nothing about you that perishes, even subtly. So, Tom Avye, I know you, you never even a small bit fed away. Shaswata Dharma Gopta. Here we need to know Dharma. That Dharma, not only that Dharma, that we are told that we should do our actions like this. But what Arjuna is talking about Krishna here is Shaswata Dharma. And dharma or swadharma literally means that shaswata dharma. It means that dharma that is within you. It is part of your nature. That's how you should act out. That's how you should be. It's like your being itself. It is your dharma. It is your nature to be like that. So you should be like that. And how Krishna is the protector of that dharma is, you know, when a seed becomes a tree and then a full-fledged fruit, we always like the fruit. Like we know it has come from this tree, but we'll give more importance to the fruit. And we sometimes forget the tree and so many times like we forget the roots where the tree is standing or the soil in which the, the tree is standing so in these terms Arjuna is saying I am seeing the fruit that you are I am seeing the full-fledged tree that you are and I'm seeing how deep your roots go into your own sobhava, into your own being, what you are yourself. And Krishna has realized that I am myself, the ultimate. I am Brahma. And Arjuna is saying that if someone can get his roots down to the unmanifest, down to the real Shaswata Dharma, then he becomes the protector of it because he is the one who will be able to give the world back that dharma. He'll be able to, because he himself has become a full-fledged person, a full-fledged human being. He has experienced this level of experience. He can give it back to human, to human beings. He can give it back to Arjuna. If Krishna himself does not know his own soul power, he cannot know Arjuna's Sobhava. He cannot tell Arjuna his Shaswat Dharma. 
He cannot tell Arjuna that you are also Brahma if Krishna himself has not experienced it. So if he has experienced it, he, he now becomes a protector of that dharma. Sanatanastvam purusho matome. And I know that I've talked about you not dying, talked about you not even fading away a little bit. But I also want to say that Sanatana, you are always, you know, something that never arises. You may feel like if something does not arise, then yeah, even that would not perish. Like an imaginary uh, cuboid that I have in my head. If that never arises, it will never perish. It will never die. But Arjuna is also saying, not in that way, like not only in that way, that if something does not arise, it never perishes in that way, but it is like it will always be. In that way, I'm saying that you'll never perish. And he is using all the words that he has to explain Krishna as he's experiencing him. It's so hard to, ex to explain in words. And we should also realize how Arjuna is trying to put his experience into words. And at the end, he will also say that even though I have tried to say everything, I still know there's a lot missing in my words and it's all that I could describe. Like that's my experience. Anadi madhyanta mananta viryam ananta bahum shashi surya netram pashyami tvam deepta hutasha vakram Swateja Savishwamidam Tapantam. I also do realize that Anadi Madhyanta Ananta Viryam. One thing is you do not have a start, you do not have an end, and you do not have a middle. We have talked about this metaphor so many times that. We can think about like not having a start and not having an end, but not having a middle, according to our terms, would mean that that does not exist. Like our existence of life is the middle of birth and death. We can say that maybe something does not have birth and death. But when we try to say that something does not have a middle, what are we trying to say? Are we trying to say that it does not exist at all? No, Krishna, Arjuna here is referring to something else here. Not that it doesn't exist, but there being no middle means that in comparison to the start and the end, the beginning and the end. Because if there's no beginning and there's no end, then there's no middle. It's like, um, would say that the middle would comprise of two ends of the lines being there. So if that line never ends, like if that line stretches out, completely there's no middle like there's no point where you would say this the middle because there's no start there's no end it's just continuously there it's always there you can't say this the middle you will say the middle of what it's just there it's just a line you don't need to say it's middle of something because it stretches out this is just I'm just giving the example of a line, just to get our imagine, like imagination going. But just to point out this, that 
what the start, the end, and the middle mean in relation to the ultimate. So ultimate that is always there, it's everywhere. So how can you say that um, if it, we know it doesn't have a start and it doesn't have an end, then you can't say it has a middle because you'll have to say a middle of something. So in that way, it doesn't have anything, neither beginning nor end, and it also doesn't have a middle in between. Ananta viryam, ananta bahum, shashi surya netra. You are full of so much energy here, ananta viryam. I can see all the energy that you bring here all the energy that you have, not just the physical energy, not also just the mental or the intellectual power that you have, also not only the emotional power you have, but there's also that energy that you have within you. It's like life itself is exploding from within you. And when life is so, it's like a volcano. You see all that energy erupting from within. And that I can see from within you. Lava is everywhere. It's like under the earth, it's everywhere. It's underlying. But when you see a volcano, you see that that energy is coming out. It's like it's expressing itself from that place. So Krishna is like that. The mani unmanifest is everywhere. But when you look at Krishna, you see that all this life is just exploding through him. It's like coming towards you from him. And that is what Arjuna is seeing within him. Ananta Bahum, Shashi Surya Netram. So Arjuna again goes to this dimension where he's saying, Ananta Bahum. It's like if we only see it physically, would we'll think Krishna at that time has gotten so many hands and he has got these eyes that now are the moon and the sun. But look at it another way that the radiance within his eyes, like you can see some people, like their eyes are just glowing. And you just see that light from within. You can't pass by them without noticing that. And that is so profound. That radiance from within is profound. That light from within. And then somebody can say that you have eyes like the moon and the sun. There's so much radiance from within. You don't know where it comes from. Like only that person knows where it comes from. But when you experience that, when you see that, it doesn't go unnoticed. Everyone just notices it. And then Ananta Bahum, it's like not physically, he has so many hands or so many arms, but in an experiential way, Arjuna is saying that. I can see you. If I want to describe the experience I'm having, let's just say a person in front of me has so many hands and that energy that will flow through him that he will be able to do with this so many hands, so many arms, uh, all that energy is flowing through you. Your, your hands are like, you know, you, you have two hands, yes, I know that physically, but the, like that energy from within, only your two hands is, are showing. I can think about so many hands, but still they wouldn't capture that energy that you have from within. And you, you're just portraying through your two hands. Pashyam mitvam dipta hutasha vak. So 
Arjuna has said that Shashi Surya Netram, your eyes are like that. And he's going on to say that Dipta Hutasha Vakram, there is that fire within you that is lighting up. And when we see a person who is energetic, we also say that there is a fire within him. So in that way, Arjuna is seeing that fire within Krishna. And then he's saying that Suatejasa Vishwamidam Tapantam. And that fire, you can see that it's not only experiential to him, but that energy is also affecting people around. It's affecting the world itself. It's like it's not only something that is experiential to one person, but everyone in this world can experience the effect that Krishna is having onto them. There's that difference that Vishwamidam Tapantam, everything is being lightened up by his existence, by his presence. And when Arjuna is saying this, he is also saying from his own perspective that not only you are experientially in that state, but when you are in front of me, like when I'm near you, I also become affected by you experientially. Like you take me to those heights of experience. You take me to those higher steps of experience. In that way, you affect me as well. And I can also see that you affect the world at large. You affect everything that you come in contact with. Another way to see this as well, Swatejasa Vishwamidam Tapantam. Meaning that now you see there is that part that is also coming in verse 20. We only want to see the ultimate as loving, kind, and benevolent, all those qualities within him. But Arjuna is also, as it's going to become clearer in verse 20, is also starting to see these other qualities within Krishna, even qualities that are made of fear, that are made of scaredness, all that, like all those qualities that fire has that are good, it also has the qualities that are bad. So Arjuna is seeing all these qualities in the ultimate. All these qualities come from the ultimate, ultimately. There's nothing that comes without the ultimate. Everything is within the ultimate and it evolves from the ultimate. And in this way, Arjuna is not seeing a problem between good and evil. There's no like, philosophical problem within his mind. Like, how did the good arise and how did the evil arise if God is only good and then evil should have arisen from something else? Arjuna is trying to say here that Swatejasa Vishwamidam Tapantam, meaning that with your fire that you have within, with that light that you have within, everything in this world is being lightened. That's the first um, explanation of that, but is also being heated by it. Tapantam meaning it's being heated by it. So in a way you see that warmth, you see the coolness, you see the coldness and you see the heat within. It's all within the ultimate. Dhyava prithivyo ridaram taram hi vyaptam tvayeke nadishas chasarva trishtvad bhutam rupa mugram tavedam loka trayam pravyathitam mahatman. This space that is between 
the earth and the skies. I just feel it is filled by you. Like I'm experiencing that. One thing we need to know here, Arjuna is not projecting something. He's not imagining something. So he's not imagining Arjun's physical, I mean, Krishna's physical body becoming so big that it fills the world. Arjuna is having an experiential reality within him. He's knowing this, that Krishna, not only as I'm seeing him physically, but that ultimate that Krishna is saying he is, that ultimate that he is saying that I am, look at me and you will know that I am the ultimate and you are also the ultimate. So what Arjuna wants to point out here is I can see you and not only you as the physical body, but I can see you as the ultimate. I can see you for who you are. I can see you as the unmanifest on which all the manifest that I see bases on. And Vyaptam Tvaye Ke Nadishascha Sarvaha. There is no place I can point out that you are not. You are everywhere. You are in all the directions. North, east, south, west, everywhere. You're just everywhere. I can, I just look backwards, still I see you. Even though I look right, I see you. Even though I look left, I see you. There's no place I cannot see the ultimate. That is what Arjuna is trying to say here. Brahma is such profound. When you see it within the manifest, you realize that each and every manifest that I see, I cannot leave out the Brahma which, which is within it. It is there. So I can see the Brahma within each and everything I'm looking at. Drishtvad Bhutam Rupam Ugram Tavedam Lokatrayam Pravyatitam Mahatman. Now, after looking at this real big or Vyapta, that form of yours that is everywhere, there's no place that is void of you. After looking at that, after experiencing that, what I am noticing is, first of all, what Arjuna is saying here is, I myself, I am getting a bit afraid in my experience. And in chapter six in Dhyana Yoga, Krishna also pointed out this, that when you're doing Dhyana, Dhyana Yoga, you should also not be, uh, you should not be scared of what you see because what you see will be totally out of your mind. And when we normally see something that is out of our logic, out of our mind, like something that we have never seen before, we normally get scared. And that's, in a way, it's fine to get scared, but don't get taken away by that scaredness. Don't get taken away by that, um, by you being afraid. Don't move away from it. Know that that is existence. That is the root of existence. That's how existence evolves. And when you come at one, at power with existence, without your mind being a layer in between, you realize this, that sometimes it can be scary, but if that is existence, then you may as well accept it as it is, not just going behind the curtains, hiding behind your mind, hiding behind the logic of what we would think was right, but coming out, getting out of that veil, and now just looking at the world as it is, without any barriers in between.
Thank you, Yogeshwar. That was uh, wonderful as always. So, I, I mean, very much appreciate your comments for that. Um, so now, folks, actually, if you would like to comment uh, on verses 17, 18, 19, and 20, go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat. And uh, go ahead and we'll start with Evanique. Hi, Yogeshwar. Thank you so much uh, for this. Um, a couple of things that I got from what you were saying is, you know, we were talking about Krishna and, you know, Krishna not being, is he still there? I, yes. Oh, there he is. And Krishna not being, uh, you know, just benevolent, not just good, but having those emotions and those qualities that we would deem as negative. I was thinking of the Christian God, and it's the same way. If you see him, especially in the Old Testament, um, I think you see the jealousy, the rage, the anger um, of God. And a lot of people have a problem reconciling that with the God that they know, a benevolent God, a good God. And I think the Gita, what it does in the commentary, in your commentary, you guess where, does is it shows you, you know, it shows it gives an explanation in a sense of why that is, is that if he's the God and he's the creation of all, then of course he's the creation of those emotions. And if we are in God's image and likeness or in Krishna's image and likeness, then we we have those emotions. So obviously it's obvious that God has those emotions. Um, so that was really clarifying. But I wanted to ask you also a question is, um, could you speak a little more what you were talking about at the end of hiding behind the mind? Yes. So one thing we normally do is when we have something in front of us, something that is existence, what we like to do is try to think about it, what it does. We want to put logic, we want to put our logic onto it. What And our logic is based on the past. It's always based on our past experiences or what we have read or what other people around us are saying. So in that way, we, are, we make sort of a globe around us that this is existence. And that is based on our logic and the logic of people around us or what we have read. So getting out of that globe that we have built within ourselves and interacting with existence as it is, saying that, yes, I know that roses are good and thorns are bad, but still I can just look at the rose and the thorn together. Just be at par with it because that is existence. It doesn't have to be differentiated. It doesn't have to be cut into two, but they will always be one and the same thing. They will be together. The rose will always have that thorn within. So that's fine for me, being at par with reality rather than hiding behind the veil, like hiding behind that logical mind that we normal, normally have, that we want to put our logic onto existence rather than accepting existence as it is. Thank you, Avnik. Um, does anybody else have any questions for Yogeshwar? If not, um, could we actually, I just would like to cover one thing really quickly. Uh, is this, what, Srikant, do you want to comment? I, no, uh, just wanted to check in. I will need to step out in about five, 10 minutes, but uh, how, how are things going? Um, it's fantastic. I mean, uh, Okay. Yeah, they're going well. Um, uh, what I was, I was going to ask is this, uh, what was it? The idea of the eternal light um, and the essence of that. Like, uh, I'm trying to frame my question because essentially 
um, the eternal is something that can be only experienced, right? It can't be spoken about. Am I understanding that correctly? So is it's something that this is why Arjuna is really struggling to come up with words, right? To to express how he feels. So this is like a really important distinction uh, between you know uh, what essentially is sometimes the Bible and 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 the Gita, in my opinion, is that it's something to be it's more about the experience of what you actually go through as opposed to maybe putting words to exactly how you feel or a particular uh, uh, theory or a concept or or idea is is that a correct way of looking at this specifically in chapter uh, verse 16 I'm thinking um in a way or yes 17, because... 17 I'm sorry sorry. Thanks. Okay, yeah. So, yes, because in a way, what Arjuna would see in the ultimate, yeah, would be a bit of a reflection of himself, a bit, because he will not he will not be able to live out himself totally from the ultimate. There is that dharma that is his own. Right. So when he describes an experience that he has had his words will be slightly tilted towards that part. And that's fine, totally, because everyone will, everyone will fall in love, but they will talk about it slightly differently. Like they will say different experiences about, about it. But what they're talking about is essentially the same thing. They're not things that are going sideways in any way. And another point that you said, the, the first point that you said that ultimate, you experience it, but when you put it into words, it's like, you know, when you put the infinite into words, you will just have one, two, three, or a hundred, a thousand, all those numbers within. So what you're doing, you're trying to describe the infinite, but what you're going to speak out would be in relation to the numbers that we know. You can't speak about the infinite as it is. What you'll speak about, the words that you'll have, will be about the numbers that you know. So in a way, you can only point towards the infinite. You can never really say the infinite, what it is. So you will go round and round, yes, because you want to try to describe it, how it is. You don't want to just say that this one point is infinite because none of the points is really the infinite. But what you want to do is the other person who you're explaining to should realize that whatever the other person has talked about is always just pointing towards the infinite. He's trying to show me what it is. And words normally would be of this world and how I can explain to you if I just say my experience, how it is, it's also like, um, you may not understand what it is. So I also have to give examples of things that you know, or what everybody is familiar with, for me to explain what I've experienced. So in both ways, that experience is profoundly founded within yourself. And another thing about you'll always want to describe to another person how the other person would understand it rather than just your experience sometimes. That's right. I mean, that's the essential part of communicating with someone else. I mean, you know, that you're, you're trying to put it in terms so that, you know, and even what we're discussing right here, you're enabling us to understand uh, what, you know, from in, in terms that we can understand it, but it's not necessarily... It's just pointing to something. It's not actually capturing the essence of the experience itself. Um, so now that, that that's phenomenal. Uh, I really yeah, appreciate so that. According to Indian culture, how, how they take it is the only way to, to know how that experience feels, it's like whatever words 
somebody else uses, like the teacher uses, what should happen within the, the student is that experience should be transferred from the teacher to the student. Whatever words they use, it's fine. It's okay. Like, but they should be right in a way. They should not be going off because if they go off, the student will never have that experience. Right. So towards the truth, they should point towards the truth. But the only way to get to the truth is transferring the whole experience to the student. And when the student experiences it is when he knows the truth. And in, in many ways, this is a very big difference between Western and Eastern thought in many ways, because the way I see it, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but sometimes I feel like a Western thought is actually caught up too much in words. Um, and whereas it's not enough about the experience, the experience uh, and getting out and actually, you know, uh experiencing something and then trying to convey what it is it's actually more theoretical uh and ivy tower kind of way of thinking about things versus actually uh you know articulating a particular understanding that uh, of an experience that they've had so i mean is that a correct way of thinking about it um putting to what i've read like if uh, what I've read about Western philosophy, like um, just the dialogue on about uh, Mino and uh, Socrates, uh, mm -hmm. it's trying to describe what morality actually is. Yeah, you describe it. If you can't describe it, you do not know it. So, in that sense, if you're talking in that sense, I would say yes. Like you're right. But there's also another way of looking at it that without any experience. You cannot just say words. Yeah. So there is an experience underlying. Right. But the the focus, how you're pointing it out, I can see that um, the focus is on words more in that description. But how how the Indian mind will view it is if the teacher can impart morality onto the student then whether there are words in between or it's just actions in between, it doesn't matter. But the, how the student knows morality is not only through words, it's actually by living morally. Right. His life should be moral. That's how he knows morality. That's how, that's how an Indian would view it. Wow. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. So does anybody else have any comments um, on verses uh, 17 through 20? If not, we can go ahead and read um, verses. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you. Can you unmute? You, you can't? Uh, let me see here. Okay, now I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The uh, I just wanted to get Yogeshwar's reaction to. Um, I don't know. I would call it an insight, but maybe an experience or a thought I had uh, reading this week, reading about uh, things related to the Bhagavad Gita. The um, and the thought was or the insight is that uh, the manifest and consciousness are two sides of the same coin. That if there is no manifest, if there's no consciousness, uh, there is no manifest. Uh, and that, I don't know, that's a lot of ideas or thoughts occurred to me based on that. The... Um, and that having a conscious consciousness is uh, arises out of being a part of the whole, because then you come at you is being, by being a part of the whole, or a, you establish relationships with other parts, or you can enter into relationships with other parts, and uh, hopefully relationships, or possibly relationships with the whole as well. The um, 
So that was the one, the one part of it. The other part was that our consciousness is not perfect. That, um, and here I thought of consciousness as, you know, honestly, the way I thought about it was consciousness of a rock, consciousness of a flower, consciousness of a human being. Uh, a rock has certain mechanisms that allow it to respond or react to its environment and changes to its environment. Uh, there also has mechanisms that allowed for the uh, giving rise to the rock. And the same is true for the flower. Uh, and we can, we can appreciate that consciousness through its reactions to the changes in the environment. And I think maybe, you know, we're all humans, so we know more what's going on inside of us than what's going on inside of flowers or rocks. But the, uh, it's kind of the same for humans that we know we have a consciousness or we do have a consciousness and that's evidenced by our reactions to the environment. And then the last thought I had in that line is that our consciousness is imperfect, just like a rock's. We can see that a rock's consciousness is, if you will, imperfect. You know, it, it serves a, the purpose of the rock. And we have uh, the flower's consciousness is not like the human consciousness, and, but it, it serves the purpose of the flower. We have a consciousness and it is not perfect. It has blind sides and uh, things we can't see, hear, appreciate. Uh, so it's also very imperfect. And just for me, just appreciating how imperfect the human consciousness can be was, uh, was an important insight. Do you have any comments on that? Um, so the first point that you uh, pointed out is the manifest and the unmanifest are like two sides of the same coin. No, the manifest like put... and consciousness, manifest and consciousness. Um, yes, so how would you put consciousness? Our own consciousness only or the consciousness of the ultimate, like the ultimate consciousness, what the ultimate is? I was thinking about my own consciousness. Oh, okay, yeah. So even in that way, so first the whole world at large yeah itself so the manifest and unmanifest are like let's say it's just one stick and then one is one side of the stick and the other is the other side of the stick it's like if there are no two sides you not say that this is a stick it it's not a stick if it doesn't have two sides so in the same way, that's how it's viewed. Even our own uh, consciousness and our own body, like itself, it's viewed that our body is made out of our consciousness in that way because our karma, our actions, because the actions in a particular way they are related to our consciousness. Like when we say yes, that's when something happens. When we say no, that doesn't happen. Like our actions are determined by us ourselves. So in that particular way, those actions also build us back. Like they also build us. They help in um, washing away the dirt, which is on top of the consciousness. But the second point that you said that consciousness is imperfect. I can see where you come from. Like, as we are right now, we are imperfect. There is a perfectness that we have to reach. There's that state that um, Arjuna is conveying and Arjuna is experiencing and Krishna always experiences. So that is what you're calling the perfect state, if I'm right? Yes. Yes. So in that way, we are imperfect. But if you look how like um, Indian scriptures display it, how they portray it, 
they portray it in a way that we are a seed. We have the potentiality of the perfectness. And whenever any scripture talks about um, how our consciousness is, they'll always say that Atman or Brahman is always perfect. Like our own nature is perfectness. But what, what is, is that it's just, um, there's just a small veil between. It's like that small layer of dust that has grown within. Maybe it is of those bad actions or is it's of that um, knowledge that we want to impart onto the world. All those veils are just in between. That is the only thing that makes the consciousness imperfect. But in, our, in its own self, the consciousness is always perfect. And uh, in another way, how Indian logic takes it, like if we take it logically a bit, how it takes it is if something is not perfect, yeah? if a seed in, in itself is not perfect, it can never become the perfect fruit. So to become the perfect fruit, it has to be like that potential has to be within from before. The potentiality has to be within. It can never be that something is one state and then it just changes state totally because consciousness is always there as it is. What happens is the potentiality is there and then the potentiality becomes full-fledged. Thank you. Um, so this question, I don't know if this is actually going to be accurate, then is this one of those distinctions, this perfection of human nature and consciousness, that is that one of the distinguishing characteristics, say, differs from like the Bible, that there is an imperfection in the sense that we're in a fallen world, we're in a fallen state, that we're born in a state of sin. So there's a sense of imperfection in Christianity that exists. Uh, is that a difference between those two? Is that fair to say? Um, I would not say a difference like per se, but I would say a difference in viewing what uh, human, like how we are. It's just a difference of view because Indian thought doesn't say that we are totally perfect, like from the beginning, yeah? In a way we are, yes. But it also recognizes these layers in between right. that have to be like washed out or that veil that has, has to be removed. So they accept both in a way. So in a way, when they're saying we are perfect, they're saying we have the potentiality of perfectness from the start. Okay. And when they're saying that there are these veils, they're saying that right now we are not that perfect. We're not that perfect we have to reach the perfectness there. So it's a way of viewing it. Not only that we are born with sin, but there is that aspect of we can get towards the perfect. Right. Yeah, so both aspects should be put in together. That's when the whole truth is known. Because truth normally is not one-sided. It's like fully... It, you should it's fully encup, encompassed in a way that's when we know the full truth thank you uh, so next up we have elena thank you um, elena can you unmute Um, are you able to unmute, Elena? Okay. Um, actually, there you go. We can hear you now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Oh, uh, just a moment. Okay. Um, 
So my, my question is to you, Gesher, why did we acquire a veil of dust in this uh, distorted view of the world? Why, why do you think that need, needed to be happening to a human being? Yeah, so that aspect of um, the actions that we do that um, make up the veil, that karma, that's how it's put in Indian uh, thought. So that karma that we do is made out of our free will. Like we know that there is something that is always there and our consciousness is always perfect. But we also know the imperfect parts of us that come from the consciousness, yes. But there is that free will and free will is taken to that level in Indian thought that if even a, like, if even a person who has become totally, like he has no veils in between, he has no dust in between, whatever you would like to put it as, he has the free will to do such actions, to put up the dust. He has that free will as actions to put up the veil in between himself and existence. So that free will we are given from, be from before. And that free will in a way, is that what um, makes us do all these actions? And then sometimes we get so much entangled within. And that's why we are just as we are. This is how we are. And that's how we are made. Thank you uh, again, uh, Yogeshwar. Does anybody else have any other comments? And let me ask you, do you have time for one more verse? Or... Yeah, I would say maybe one more verse only. Yeah, so about 10 minutes, 10, about 15 10. minutes will be fine. Okay, all right, well then um, if there are no other comments with, uh, with for verses uh, 17 through 20, would anybody like to read verse 21? If not, I can go ahead and read it. Uh, Evanique. Okay, uh, verse 21? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The companies of the gods enter thee, afraid adorning the rishis and the siddhas, crying, may there be peace and we'll praise thee with many praises. Ami hitwam surasanga vishanti kechid bhita pranjala yo grinanti swasti tyukta maharshi siddha sanga stuvanti tuam stuti bhi pushkala bhi. Arjuna here is putting up that experience that he is having. That I am having this experience that. I myself, I'm getting scared of this experience that I'm having itself. So out of scaredness as well, I am feeling like I want to praise you. I want to worship you. I'm saying that everything should be fine in a way. Swasti yukva, meaning good be unto all and good be also unto me one aspect that is really shown in this verse it's really highlight is the aspect of being afraid and also being afraid how it is seen in indian thought how it is seen in indian culture being afraid is totally okay it's fine to be afraid. What is not fine is being carried away 
by that scaredness, by that experience of being afraid. So what we are seeing here is first Arjuna had that experience of being so much loved in, in the first verses. And he can see all that benevolence that Krishna is showing towards him. He has revealed the ultimate to Arjuna. And then he also sees the ultimate within Krishna. He sees all the good things. Kiritinam, Gadinam, Chakrinam, Cha. Yeah? He's seeing all the light, all the radiance within Krishna. And then, not only that, but he's also seeing these other aspects. Being scared or being afraid, all that. Yeah? And he's saying, I am also afraid of this experience. So in that same way, I am also seeing others, Sura Sangha, meaning all, all those that you pointed out in chapter 10, that are your forms that point out to the ultimate more than the other manifest. So all those are also getting scared. Yeah, it's like, you know, sometimes when you, you yourself fall in love, you, you see that even a rose is in love. Even a rock is in love. It's like you just see it. You experience it. And then when you yourself, you're scared or you're angry, you see that anger onto everyone else as well. You see that anger within non-living things as well. So Arjuna here is having an, an experience and he's seeing that even others as well are having this experience. Not only me, but those who have had this experience before, have also felt this fear that I'm feeling. They were also scared of the ultimate as I am. And, they, and he gets to know this. And we can see that at the start, right, in verse 14, pranamya shirasa devam kritan jalira bhashata. So there Arjuna, he bowed down, folded his hands, that was of pure worship, just because he knows the ultimate has revealed itself to him. It's automatic in that way. And here, what he is experiencing is pranjalo yogrinanti. Like also here, hands are folded, but there is an aspect to it: fear, and that is also. In a way, those Sura Sangha, all those who have experienced this reality before, they have also asked for good be unto the whole world. And then they have also, in so many ways, Pushkala bi, Stuti bi, in so many ways, they have worshipped and praised the ultimate. There are two ways of getting to the ultimate. One is through fear and one is through love. And in this, in Gita, in Indian thought, we can see both are taken into account. Like first the love, all the benevolence that Arjuna is shown and his hands are folded. And then he also experiences that part that not only love, but even fear is there in the ultimate. And if I go towards the ultimate using fear, using that expression as well, I will get to the ultimate. Like, there is nowhere the ultimate is not. Ultimate is also here. If I experience the ultimate like this, it's not a fault. It's not a downfall but it is a way of experiencing the ultimate. It's a way of experiencing the ultimate. It's also a way of expressing the ultimate as well. 
And that's what Arjuna is getting to here. Not only benevolence, but also getting scared is fine towards the ultimate. It's a way of getting to the ultimate. And when you get there, you also experience both at the same time. And that's how you experience the ultimate. Everything within the ultimate and the ultimate within everything. So there's fear that actually brings you closer to the ultimate, right? But is there a fear that takes you away from the ultimate? So like the idea that just say this, and, and I'm thinking about this in terms of, uh, and this is in more in stoic terms, is the idea that you fear the loss and detachment of, or, or loss of material things. And that is a, a, that is a different type of fear that would take you away from your, your, your center. Uh, is, that, is there a distinction there? Yes, there's a big distinction between, and as fear takes you away from the ultimate, even love or attachment towards uh, material things can take you away from the ultimate. So both sides, you can see the ultimate is there and then you can also see how the distinction is made because all the benevolence that he has received from the ultimate if he sh if that love is shown all towards something material then it will take arjuna towards another path totally but what arjuna here is describing is how both can take you towards the ultimate it's a really interesting point because I feel like you get to the essence of what the emotion actually is and what it can do. You get to the essence of what fear is and what love is in the sense that it can be both uh, destructive and it can be both, you know, liberating as well in the sense that it brings you closer to the ultimate. But it can also, if you love material things if you love the wrong things if you aren't knowledgeable then then essentially you're misdirected in what you love and 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 that it can be actually a negative so we intend to think of it gets to the essence of what these things are and that they can be misdirected and 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 how we use them yeah that's true that's a very so um folks if anybody has a question about number uh Number 21, uh, go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat. F and H. I have a quick question. The fear, when you say we can use fear to get to the ultimate, do you mean like a reverence for, like a fear or reverence for? Krishna, or, or I, I'm a little confused by that. Yeah, so um, you can see in Indian culture, yeah, one thing that is shown is Krishna is revered to, like he has a flute in his hands and he's playful, is that joyful, like there's that joyful aspect that is put to him. And then there are also other things that are seen about Krishna, uh, where um, somebody will actually get afraid of Krishna when he's doing that. And that is also described totally, if you look at uh, Vishnu Purana or if you look at Bhagavad Purana, the little deeds that Krishna did during, through his life, all those, yeah? So whether it is the up, that you can see in a person, or it's the down that you can see in a person. Like one thing that um, Krishna did was to run away. Like there was a king called Jarasandha and he came to destroy Krishna's kingdom 18 times. 17 of those times, the first 17 times, Krishna stood still 
and fought Jarasandha. The 18th time, what Krishna did was to run away from Jarasandha. So you see how all those stories, yeah, in a way, you can, you can see that Krishna, you can feel that Krishna is, has feared, like he's fearing Jarasandha, now he's running away because Jarasandha is way powerful than Krishna. But if you think another way as well, like that's also an aspect to be revered to. Like if somebody can bow down to an aspect where Krishna is in victory 17 times, then can he also bow down to that Krishna who runs away the 18th time? Yeah, who, that is the aspect that we are talking about here. Don't only um, allow joy into your, into your world. Also accept fear as well. Accept being nervous as well into your life. Like make it, a, make it a part of your life and accept it as it is rather than running away from one and getting attached to another always. Because when you run away, you never really run away because you're always thinking about it. Like when you're running away, like when you're running away from scaredness or being afraid, you're always going to be thinking about that which you're afraid of. And in that way, you're going to be physically away from it, but mentally attached to it again. So accept everything as it is. Being fear, like being fearful, being joyful, everything in one a big grand package from the ultimate and use it to get towards the ultimate whatever tools you have thank you that really made a lot of sense thank you so much does anybody else have any questions or comments about verse 21 or anything for that matter. Any comments for Yogeshwar? If not, actually, I mean, I I was reading about Ishvara, is, is for, Ishvara's, um, am I saying that correctly? Oh, go ahead, uh, Elena, I'll give you Um, you guess where, why did Krishna run away from the Jarasa? You said, what's the story behind it? Yeah. Um, the story behind it is like, um, so in a way, Krishna has to protect his people and he knows the strength that somebody has. He knows the strength that he himself has. So Jarasan, on the 18th time, he came with the largest army. Like at the 17 times he was coming with one army, his own. The 18th time, he came with a joint army, like joint of two, three kingdoms together. And Krishna knew his own um, wealth and his own power. And he knew the power of the enemy as well. So when you know both, the best decision you take for the people, like for your own people, is more important. In a way, if he fought that battle, his own people would have died more rather than saving his own people. And in that way, you can see that even being, like even showing fear in that instance was a good thing rather than fighting head on and get, having most of his people killed rather than protecting them. So he has shown that he is a warrior, but he's also shown that when time comes, you can also take that decision that a true warrior should take of protecting his own people, rather than just going ahead every time. So you should know when to go head on and when to pull back. Both should be known in a way. That reminds me of the Tao, actually. We covered that um, as well in, in several verses of the Tao. 
uh, is the idea of when to move forward and when not to move forward. Uh, and and uh, no, that was, uh, I forget which verse off the top of my head, um, but uh, there was an element of wisdom that's involved with that. So um, does anybody else have a comment? Um, so I'll be leaving now. Okay, yeah. sure. So you okay. can continue. Well, the, thank the you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And and thank you very much for. We we were talking about it last night. Just so you know, just how much you add to this meetup. Uh, it really is uh, remarkable, and and we're very very fortunate to have you here. Uh, thank very you. fortunate. Thank you, Yogeshwar. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you. Thank soon. you. Right. Um, so, Joe, I'm still working on my stuff. So, okay. Uh, I will. I'll probably need to interrupt in about five minutes or so when okay. the phone rings. But okay. Um, so, how how was how was it today? It was. It, it, you know, this was an interesting experience because I it, I I like it in the sense that I was pushing myself to speak a little bit more and try and engage a little bit more. Um, and I think that's very helpful in thinking about things. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, it was a little bit of a shock to the system because it was like, okay, I'm, I'm now, I usually, I wait for both of you. You play both, both yeah. of you play so well right. off of each other, but it, it was like for moderating, you don't need to do anything. You just let Yogeshwar speak, let other people speak. And that's, that's good. So you don't need to, uh, it's, it's um, the, the thing is that what happens is that like Gita has a certain tone and you yes. sure captures it really well, really yes. well. So uh, that's, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say, I mean, yesterday, all the comments of everybody was just, just blew me away. I, I think, I think we are really onto something, uh, onto something really big. So it's uh, wonderful, wonderful to see that. I, you know, I will say this as, as, as actually, you know, and in particular hosting this evening when you're kind of like really engaged in a little bit, it, it the, especially going through chapter 10, I think, you know, I, I'm not trying to compare and contrast because everything has, you know, its own unique value, but um, I do feel that this is the deepest of the three works uh, that we've covered thus far I, 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 mean, I think so too I think I mean so. I, I don't know enough but I feel I, that I mean it it's like if you look at I mean I would say Dao De Jing is the simplest in some way it's yeah. very profound but it's very simple what it is saying is simply you know there is the Dao all of the Dao in various ways and, and take inspiration from nature and how it moves in order to do that. It doesn't try to capture all of these things in words explicitly. It's saying, look, there's a limit of what I can do. And then just talks about Tao metaphorically in many, many different ways. So in that sense, I think Tao Te Ching is the most simple. Like Bible is far more explicit mm -hmm. in, um, and I think Bhagavad Gita is far is even more explicit. It is, it is. I, I, if I wanted to distinguish it from the Bible, um, I would say a few things. I mean, firstly, I think it is more. Um, it is richer in the sense that the richness with which it describes, let's say, karma yoga, uh, bhakti yoga, jnana yoga, especially the jnana yoga is very, very deep of how do you come to self-knowledge. The other part of it is the focus. There is a much greater focus on the inner life. That focus on inner life, I think Tao Te Ching is least, Bible is more than that. And I think Bhagavad Gita is even more than that of kind of awareness of what is going on inside you. In some ways, Tao Te Ching is like, drawing inspiration from the nature and then letting that seep into your consciousness, something like that. Whereas there are on the other extreme, 
Indian philosophy has these explicit ways, techniques, practices, schools of concentration and training your attention, shaping your attention. So it's it's a so th those are the two, and Bible is kind of uh, in the middle. What what do you guys think? Um, how how would you compare these three works? Go ahead and type a exclamation mark if you would like to share. You don't need to have a definitive answer. You can just give an impressionist answer uh, of what differences do you see. Uh, we've talked a lot about commonalities. Now, would love to hear what you see as differences. Uh, go ahead, Evnik. So I think uh, Joe has said it earlier, I think it was Joe that said it earlier, that the Gita is definitely more experiential, whereas the Bible is more words. Um, I think that's the one thing. I think the Tao is more, um, I think the Tao is kind of the mix between the two. It uses words to describe it, but you, it's words, you apply it to your experience in a sense. So you, you take the words of the Tao and you experience them. I think the Bible is very much rule-based, still law-based especially the Old Testament, the New Testament kind of goes away from that, but it's still that. And I think uh, the Gita, I mean, it's a story about a war and uh, Arjun's experience of not wanting to fight because it's his family and his friends. And through, the pro through his journey, um, he gets to experience Krishna in all his form. And so especially tonight when we were talking about it, um, I think I just lost my thought on that. When we were talking about it, you guess where I was talking about using fear to get to the center in a sense that we accept the fear. So I feel like there's a lot of acceptance of human nature in the Gita, whereas the Bible it's kind of like it's there, you know, there's the imperfection, but that imperfection is evil and you have to do this thing to get out of it. And there's no real way out of it in the Bible, right? There's no real way out of the evil in the Bible or being like an imperfect human being. Whereas the Gita is just like more of an acceptance of who you are, whereas the Bible, you're fighting it all the time, which is, as a uh, as a uh, Bible believing Christian, which I was, which I when you believe that the Bible is kind of like infallible, um, it, it's it's almost suppressive because you're fighting something that you know you can't win, whereas the Gita allows you to accept the simple fact that you know the fear is there. And to move forward anyway, or to not move forward, because he just told the story right before he left about uh, Krishna fighting. I can't pronounce the the other guy's name. And he fights him, yes, and he fights him seventeen times, and then the eighteenth time he runs away. And sometimes taking a step back or walking away, I think, is a valid and great response. And that's what br brings you to the center. Is sometimes knowing when to walk away from things that are just not, it, like, you know you're not going to win and you're going to lose more by trying to fight. You're going to lose more of yourself. So that's that's what I brought in. That's what I got from it. You know, that, that, that's a very, very interesting uh, point that you just brought up because I, I felt that overall, one of the most important things that I see in the Gita and feel free everyone to type exclamation point in the chat to just to talk about what you see as the distinction between these three works or what you're getting from the Gita as a whole. Um, but I'm starting to see the the and when we're and again when we went through chapter 10 the use of metaphors in the Gita are very very powerful in communicating the concepts uh, as opposed to it's 
as Srikant said, where um, it, it's 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 a more of a of this the Bible's much more explicit and prescriptive in a way, uh, and it's a story, and the story has an objective. I would say, whereas not to say that these metaphors don't, but they they are there's a, there's a depth to them that requires a little bit i think a little bit more introspection um or it enables a little bit more introspection uh something that was interesting as i was talking to somebody who was recently who was studying buddhism and they were going to different buddhist teachers and uh and i actually recommended that they speak to sri khan um as uh, if he had time uh because they were going very deep into buddhism and i felt like the gita and hinduism was far deeper and really captured a lot of the same concepts that you would really if you really wanted to d go deep that this is the this is the work that you would actually want to uh to to um uh read about an experience uh so i mean I, I think that that to me is one of the most um useful ways of actually and then the the idea of the center and the periphery concept is well is makes it very very clear as to you know wanting to look inwards and uh marco go ahead actually so um, i've been talking a little bit too much um like uh, for me like that i know the um, the gita like it, it kind of like built uh builds you up like a lot of the things that you know the uh Rogesh, Rogeshar says like yeah it sort of like uplifts you i guess and it like makes you feel like at least from my point of view like it makes me feel like more empowered like the point of like that you know that uh like i am the 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 manifested and the unmanifested and that i'm you know the that i'm a i'm a god just as you know every like everyone and every um and everything is a god and and i guess that the dao is more like tells you a little bit like how to be and like how to act um and then the and then like the i haven't gone to a lot of a lot of the um the 52 living like um the the bible meetups but i know that like yeah it put i think it the Bible has that sort of like, um, you know, sayings that like build you up, but I think it puts like less responsibility like on the person. And yeah, it's sort of like, you know, you're entrusting yourself to God instead of like um, that you're sort of empowered, you know, like self empowerment, I guess. Right. Um, yeah. That, that. Oh no! I mean, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I, 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 I was agreeing with you. Were you done, Marco? Oh uh, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry if I. Sometimes I agree, and I'm just thinking out loud there. Um, but uh, Brian, do you have any? Well, the question was uh, one of the questions was what's the difference between these. And I think that one difference is the uh, point of departure, mm. which you might, uh, you could uh, characterize as assumptions that are captured in certain words. Like in the Tao, you assume, the point of departure is the Tao, you assume that there is a Tao. Uh, in, uh, in John, 
you know, in the beginning was the word and the word was God. So you assume there was a word and you assume there's God and you kind of build things up from there. And in the Bhagavad Gita, I'm not quite sure. I'd have to look back. And But one thing that strikes me is the Gita is the ultimate, the Atman and the Brahman. And uh, in all of these three, I think the uh, question is, you know, how, sh how should, you know, for the reader, how should I behave? Um, and in... Uh, both the case of Jesus and uh, Arjuna, the issue in more in Arjuna than than Jesus, it comes up in it in a what you call I would call a borderline situation, extreme situation, where he uh, defines who he is, and in the course of that. There is a tremendous, I think, just a wonderful explanation by Krishna to Arjuna of what is the ultimate, all of which feed into uh, this answer of what he should do in this situation. And so, uh, and then Jesus is a little bit, is uh, the same in that he is in a, with the Garden of Gethsemane and the crucifixion and uh, taking on the the mission, submitting to the will of God. Uh, this is uh, again, he's in a an extreme situation where he defines who he is, uh, and a lend, to answer that is a lot of that has to do with his relationship to God, um, God's relationship with him and other people. So. Uh, there's an there's an examination of all of the you know the a very important constituent parts of the world and also in the Jesus story there's no I don't see a, an individual there's no individual that we're focused on in the Tao but uh, there's a series I suppose of uh, extreme situations more or less extreme uh, that are posited in these various verses and then suggestions of how to behave based on the Tao. So I think to me, the, as I said at the beginning, the key thing is the, the point of departure. That was very well said. I mean, I think that you know, you've made several uh, points there. And, and I actually, you know, I, I uh, like the Tao, you know, quite a bit, um, but it's sometimes it's a little bit more difficult for me to extract uh, some of the the more practical aspects of it, uh, where I don't necessarily see that is much an issue with with the Gita. Or, or the Bible for that matter. Um, you know, not to, not, to, not to compare and contrast, but you know, I think the Tao is much more flexible uh, in, what it, in what it's saying. And it's, you know, you're essentially, you're looking to nature. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, um, and, and there are a lot of similarities too, but I, 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 I like the Tao a great deal. I didn't mean, I don't mean to be, uh, you know, kind of comparing the two, but I, one is, I find the Tao to be much more spiritual for me. Uh, whereas I find the Gita and, and, and the Bible to have a pretty strong message, uh, when in the stories that they're telling, but I, I appreciate what you said is how they differ at the part at the point of departure. Uh, um, uh, I think that, you know, those are very, very good points. Um, does anybody else have anything that they would like to share about the Gita, Bible, or the Tao? Nobody?
Well, I mean, I can continue to share for a couple more minutes. Um, and I, I don't know if Srikant will be back by 11, but um, Madhav, go right ahead. Yeah, um, so I had more of a question. Um, so the Abrahamic traditions, they typically believe that the text is the word of God. So there's a lot of rigidity in that. Um, sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad. But do you guys feel when you um, are following the spiritual path uh, in Christianity versus Hinduism, there's a difference because the text is taken as word of God, or do you feel there is no difference? I think that there's a big difference. I think I feel, I personally feel that way, um, primarily because I, I feel like I'm looking inward in order to look outward as opposed to looking for this, you know, uh, this external God actually to provide me with uh, the way. Um, I think that there's there's a there's a there's a lot more of um, introspection that goes along with the Gita in, in my journey, uh, and I've kind of embraced them both. Um, there's I do take solace in you know when I was practicing Christ, Christianity um, in a. Uh, I felt like I was having a conversation with God, uh, and I felt like I was never alone. Um, so there is that aspect of it, which, but the way I look at when I think of Hinduism and, and the Gita, uh, I think of actually trying to see my own potential and, uh, and see to really get to the core of who I am. Uh, and a point of acceptance and so that I can have more authentic and meaningful relationships with other people. Uh, I think they, they both try to create an environment for meaningful relationships, uh, but they just go about it a little bit differently. That would be my answer. Um, Evanique followed by Brian. Yeah, um, so my answer would be similar to yours, and I think there's another aspect to that too, and it's in terms of responsibility. I think in Christianity, you can, there there are some sects, I guess they're called sects of Christianity that believe in predestination in that you are, it is determined whether you're going to go to heaven or hell, and there's reasons for that in the Bible. Like uh, for instance, Judas, it was always Judas's job or fate to betray Jesus. Um, and so they used passages like that to describe predeterminism. So that kind of like lets you off the hook in a sense. And it, it, it avails you of responsibility. I think with the Gita, there is a personal responsibility for your own spirituality in your own relationship with God. Um, I do think the Bible does have you rely on God more, whereas Gita is like the God is in you. So you're relying on yourself more because the, in the Gita, you're at the center, like you're at the core and the core is you and you are the core. So um, you go inward, right? With the Gita, but with the Bible, you're relying on an external God. And so I think that, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but I, I think those, I, I, that, that's my answer. I don't know if I answered your question. I apologize if I didn't. No, totally makes sense. Thank you. Next up, we have Brian. Uh, on another difference between the Tao and the Bible and the Gita, the uh, not so sure about where to go with the Gita, but the Tao, most of the uh, allusions, references are, are to nature. And so I think it's read, you know, I'm, if this is, I would never, I would, I, let me just say it and then we can discuss it. It's the, uh, it's more accessible to everyone. 
because everyone has encounters with nature. Yes. Yeah. Uh, having said that, you know, uh, I can't claim to that the Tao was transparent to me at all. I got so much from our discussions. Now on the, uh, if the Tao is nature that's generally accessible, the Bible is uh, more uh, history and culture. There's a lot of allusions to uh, history and culture in the, in John, not entirely, but you know, that's something that I think it's essential to know the uh that you know the belief is that the god inter intervenes in history and he intervened in the history of the jewish people so uh you need to know these illusions these you know in the beginning was the word well there have been a lot of words in the old testament and uh you need to kind of know what some of those words were to understand what's being said in uh, in john the um so there's a cultural and historical uh, allusions and references there, not exclusively, but I think uh, a very important part that needs to be understood. Now in the Gita, I'm not quite sure. The only, my only reaction is right now, I haven't really thought about that so clearly is the, uh, it seems like there's a lot of, uh, I would call, you know, the, uh, I, I want to use the word speculation because it doesn't follow the follow the Western scientific method, but there, you could also say they're intuitive insights into the nature of humans, human being, the nature of human life, the nature of uh, life, the world, the universe, and uh, all these insights I find are also. Again, I can't claim to have understood this up front, but as it's explained to me, it seems that those are ex accessible to everyone in a way that these uh, cultural and historical references are not accessible in the Bible. So for me, the Tao is the more nature. The Bible is more historical and cultural in terms of presentation and the, uh, the Gita is intuitive insights. That I think are those are three very very important points, and I appreciate you bringing them up um, because I had not thought about it, and and the accessibility aspect of it is actually really important as well. Um, you know that that uh, in a way I felt like this came up in the Bible in a way, in a way many times. Uh, that Christ was universally accessible, right? He, he made himself, it wasn't necessarily just to a, a sect of people, but it was to everyone. Uh, he was the savior of the world. So that, you know, that there is, but there was a historical and cultural aspect to that. Uh, and he was kind of, you know, kind of breaking from what had been, I guess, uh, conventional belief systems uh, at that particular moment in time so you, understanding the history the culture and everything about it was really critical yeah even uh, the word like messiah is a uh, you know it's got a long history uh in the jewish tradition right and that was you know is he the messiah if so what does it mean to be the messiah that's a very key question in the in john's gospel if you don't have some understanding of what we're talking about in terms of Messiah, then, you know, that's, uh, that needs to be explained to you. <laughs> yeah, no, it absolutely does. Whereas again, and, and this is why it was such an amazing point that you just made is this idea of nature uh, is something that we all experience. You can pick up the Tao and read it. And we had, you know, the, 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 uh, ability to go through it with a group, which was, you know, very fortunate because it provided us with a whole set of, you know, new insights, uh, specifically, you know, obviously with yourself and, and, and Jason and then Amon uh, kind of leading the way um, that, that it was really 
you know, that, that was something that um, I felt that it was really kind of, it was had a huge impact on me. I didn't realize how much until this week, actually, when it ended. And I, I started to really think about it. Um, but it is something I just picked up. We started reading it. And you started to see the importance and all the the ideas and concepts of living through nature, um, of understanding, even uh, seeing parts of uh, the art of war actually being used in, in the, that were used in in the uh, Dao Te Ching. Um, you, you can it's really accessible to everyone. You don't need a lot of context because we all interact with nature. It helps. It helped in certain circumstances to, to know what they were talking about contextually. And that came out in the translation, but it really is much more accessible. Um, and I like the idea of the intuition aspect of the Gita. Uh, I do find it to be much more intu intuitive which is actually one of the most powerful things that I've taken away from it at all, because the more you look and the more you follow your own intuition as to what you really feel and believe the thing is to be, you know, right. Um, that's, and I kind of saw this when we were covering transcendentalism is that you're relying on your intuition and knowing what the right thing to do is regardless of what society is telling you is the right thing to do. Uh, so it is much more of an internal journey and experience. And it, you know, really drives how you act in the world. I think that those three distinctions are uh, really capture uh, the differences in the three works, but also the beauty of the three works as well. Um, in 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 uh, in just and then with the Bible a little bit of uh, you do I always I did feel like there I did need a lot more history and I still do of you know what of the Old Testament and understanding even just um, understanding the times themselves a little bit more deeply. Uh, so that I, I can really have a better understanding of of what Christ is actually the problem that he's answering. I mean, I have some ideas, but anyway. So does anybody else have any comments? Thank you for sharing that, Brian. That was really insightful for me personally. No? Well... If Srikant's not coming back, I'm going to announce uh, what's coming up this weekend. Let me see. Um, okay, so Brian, actually, I'll be at the Asian Philosophies meetup uh, tomorrow. That's the plan. Uh, you're going to have to tell me I'm going to miss that, actually. Um, so that is Asian philosophies reading uh, Zhuang Zizu, if I'm saying that incorrectly, just you'll have to forgive me, on the equality of things. Actually, that looks really, really interesting. Uh, and that's at seven o'clock uh, tomorrow. Uh, and that's with Jason's group as well. You can also register through the Asian philosophies meetup and as well on 52 Living Ideas. Um, at five o'clock, we're starting a new, uh, book series, uh, blindness by Jose Saramago, uh, on the fragility of society. And that will be over the course of five different meetups. And this is the first one of them. So if you, I think they're only covering about 70 pages, so it's still there's still time if you haven't read the book uh, to try and get caught up to the group. And, and I think the book as a whole is around 300, 300 pages or something, a little over that. 
So you'll have plenty of time to get caught up for the other meetups. So I encourage you to attend if you're interested in that. And then Sunday, this just got posted uh, and I'm excited about this. It's the Myers-Briggs MBTI and Young Self individuation mapped on to Srikant's uh, radiant hex hexagon diagram. So if you haven't seen any of these past meetups, these are, uh, it's a really interesting diagram. I spent some time with it actually um, last night and, and even today, just looking at it and seeing how it really is. I have some que questions for Srikant, so I'm excited. Uh, I'm gonna have an opportunity to ask him this weekend, but it's really, really a lot of fun. Um, and I, I think it's a very powerful diagram and I'm looking forward to that one in particular. Uh, and then on at nine o'clock, there's the Eucharist in the Gospel of John and that's being led by Gary. Uh, and that should be a lot of fun as well. Um, Gary's been leading and I, I let me see if... Uh, Yes, he's, uh, yeah, it will be Gary. Um, and he actually did his master's uh, thesis on this specific su subject. So this actually should really be a fantastic meetup. Um, I'm not, not to, let me see, not to uh, go into too much detail, but I don't see you register, register for that, Brian. I hope you make it. <laughs> I just... <laughs> Just put you on the spot, Brian. He just you know, put you I, right I, I, on the I, spot. So, um, in any case, uh, well, you know, I, I don't get tired of seeing you. Um, let me see. And so, and then uh, I, and then we have our poetry Mondays. So that's not coming up uh, right now. Okay. Yes. Read your favorite poems and collaborate with poetic expressions. Uh, and that is Monday. And then we're starting a new series. Um, technically, oh, you're here. Yes. Well, you, you know, you have. Um, you're doing so well. Oh, uh, no, no, I, I it could be. I'm going to go back to listen to this. I, I am going to get the courage. After looking at your model, I'm starting to see where I lacked. I like courage and listening <laughs> to myself. And okay, if I, I did, I, it would be so I'm helpful. Crazy. I it would be so unfortunately i'll i'll, I'll we'll, we'll, we'll take over okay well okay it was actually um so anyway i think i had it wrong actually um it says interpreting the Dao De Ching using multiple inter uh, interp translations uh i next think chapter. that was a placeholder okay so yeah i i believe that is i think you know this will be the first week that were covering Confucius, the Analects. So, um, Evan so. Eek and I are are putting together something on the the goddess. Yeah. Oh, okay. Do you want to talk about that for a moment? Well, I guess what I'll say was I've been on vacation, and Evan Eek knows this for almost a month, and then my wife had a scheduled operation on her nose yesterday removing polyps from her sinus and Aww. yeah so that's i wouldn't say that's minor but it's also not a major operation and the uh it was the same day i brought her home but it's been pretty exhausting week for me but i have read two books now and i'm ready to rock and roll on that uh but i need to touch best with ava Evanique first okay yeah we could definitely do that it'll probably be I will probably have to coordinate with you, Kant, but they'll probably like towards the end of May, you think, Brian? Yeah, we got to, uh, we'll have to just talk and figure it out. Yeah. Okay. So we'll look, we're looking forward to that series. And then, um... could I, I'm sorry, could I ask um, the Confucius, what day and time is that? Is that all? I, th so that is going to be at nine o'clock on Tuesday unless I'm um, very wrong, so. Thank you. No, no problem. Um, yeah, that'll be Tuesday, nine o'clock. And 
uh, that is being led by Jason. Uh, and Srikant will lead the first one uh, until we get a, a process down uh, that works. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to that. Joe, I thought you were translating. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm going to translate English to English. Uh, so, um, but uh, yes, and Prime, what was, who's the, I'm sorry, and, and I'm going off, so that's right. But Brian, who was the um, economist that you mentioned the other night to me? Lionel so, Robbins. Thank you. I, I wrote it down and then I lost it when I was looking for it today. It's a fairly short book. It's very well done. It's not, uh, he doesn't have any ax to grind. He doesn't belong to any particular school. He's not trying to make any points. It's, I think, yeah. a very good history of economic thought. That's exactly who I need to, uh, to read because everybody else has a perspective on the world. Um, so, well, this is fun. This is fun. Um, I enjoyed this. This is a, this is a good end of the week and um, we're going to have a really good weekend, uh, you know, both at 52 Living Ideas and, uh, and here in Philadelphia. We're going to have an opportunity to to see Shrikant. So, um, so it's going to be really, it's going to be a really good weekend. So, uh, thank you, everybody, as always. And I'll see you. And I hope Penny feels better. Yeah. Thank you. Give her our love. Give I Penny will. Our love. She hears you right now. Oh, good. Oh, good. 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 All right. All right. I'm, I'm glad. I'm, feel better soon, Penny. Yes. Yeah. You're in our Thank thoughts. You here. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Joe. Hey, no problem, Connie. Thank you.